Welcome to the Marshall Pruitt Podcast. In our week in IndyCar series, your Q&A. Yet again, it is a standalone special. I don't know if it feels special, but we're going to go with it being special. It is 1018 on a Thursday night. Left the house at about 5.50 something this morning to get down to Monterey for the open test day. Left at about 6.15, drove up to the Bay Area, got in there a little late to uh, spend some time with my wife in the hospital, then drove the 45 minutes across the Bay to get home here. Just had a little bit of dinner, and I'm turning around and leaving at about 6 in the morning. So you all, as usual, sent in a ton of great questions. going to go for about an hour, hour 15 See how many I can get through. This won't be the normal, somewhat relaxed, breezy roll through. Y'all send in a lot. I think we got about 90 questions total this week for my guests and I. So I want to get to as many as I can, just out of respect for the time you took to send these in. We'll mention, as always, our show is brought to you by Cooper Tires. We're doing a n- two shows in Monterey. Hopefully you'll be hearing this and attending at least one Friday with all the rookies at five o'clock and then Saturday on the Cooper Tire stage in the infield at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca with the amazing Robert Wickens, Brian Herta, Joseph Newgarden, Sebastian Bourdais. So hope to see you at one, if not both of those, if you're going to be in town Also wanted to say thanks to Andy Bauer, one of our listeners, one of our top listeners, according to Facebook. Been doing a giveaway here in probably, what, a little over a month now? Gotten back in the routine of giving y'all stuff, courtesy of our partners at torontomotorsports.com. And so what we've been doing is choosing the person's question who got the most likes, the most upvotes, on the Marshall Pruitt Podcast Facebook page. So there might be a little bit of an incentive to like, subscribe, or do whatever it is you do to track what we do via the MP Podcast Facebook page. So using the question thread there, Andy's question last week for my guest Robin Miller and I of what are the chances of the Foyt team not being at St. Pete was the most liked. And so, as a result, our pals at TorontoMotorsports.com going to send Andy a little MP podcast care package. So, week in IndyCar t-shirt, beer and or beverage koozie, some stickers, who knows? They tend to throw in some really cool and fun stuff there. Uh, Could be hamburger and french fry t-shirt, frankly, if it's in the general family of podcast goodies that our pals at TorontoMotorsports.com produce. I think you can kind of sort of pick what you want, Andy. So drop me a note, something via direct message. Derek Koska, my good pal who runs TorontoMotorsports.com, will get you all sorted. So thanks, Andy, for sending that in. And obviously, whomever's question this week gets the most likes, upvotes, whatever you want to call it, on the Marshall Pruitt Podcast Facebook page will be the winner of next week's. So We'll mention that whenever we see who all did end up getting the most likes from our guests this week, Tim Sindrick and Anders Krohn. Also, huge thanks to the Justice Brothers. They It's a perfect name. The Justice family, Ed Justice, his daughter Courtney, his wife, just the whole family. Old, old friends of mine dating back to the IRL days when they were a sponsor of a team that I managed there. And really cool of the Justice Brothers, their automotive chemicals and lubricants that are new to the show this year, but they have quickly become, I don't know, they've just become so deeply embedded in what we do. So a huge thank you to them. And then finally to our super awesome pals at Bell Racing Helmet USA. I just said helmet as if they make one. You know, that's the thing. When you try and record a podcast after you've been up for a lot of hours in a row, sometimes stupidity falls out of your mouth. Some of you right now might be saying, 
but what's your excuse the other times, Pruitt, when it's not late and you have had enough sleep? Well, you got me. So, Bell Racing Helmets as well, good partners of ours. So, with that said, and the natural love given to all of those who support us, now it's time to get into you all who support what we do, first and foremost, We're going to go with our man, Nick Vance, who says, Hey, MP, not sure if this has been addressed yet, so my apologies. Obviously, we know the Halo slash windscreen is slotted for competition in the IndyCar Series next year. Has a similar announcement and plan been laid out for the latter series? And if so, what is the timeline for implementation? Is it a topic of conversation at this time? Wishing the best for you and Chabrell. Thanks for the last note there in particular, Nick. My wife has set to come home next week end of next week that'll be about four months in the hospital so yeah i'm a really happy boy and we're moving finally next wednesday so before too long i'll get to talk about things in the past instead of things being in the present funny you should ask this about halo windscreen aero screen and the road to indy sat down with jay fry for about an hour today right on one hour with himself Tino Belli, another member of his technical team, and this was the exact topic of conversation. Didn't have a 100% answer on this, keeping in mind that the Road to Indy is not something that IndyCar owns. They are aligned with Anderson Promotions. Dan Anderson, his daughter Michelle Kish, who run this entire thing. They certainly, according to Jay, are someone that they would like to work with to pass down, filter down, what they are developing here. So I think this is more of a watch this space question. Something I don't think 2020 is going to be the time where we see this filter down, but I do believe we will see this coming soon. It would look very strange if IndyCar did this and yet it's training series. The one it's aligned with does not. I think parents very soon, very quickly would be saying, Hey, let's make this happen. Let's go to our pal Josh Shimizu next. Josh says, now that we know Penske and Dreddy and Ganassi's drivers and teams will be testing the aero screen, do you believe it gives those teams an advantage going into next season? And if so, does any car have the resources to eliminate that advantage in the future by conducting independent testing? Interesting one here, Josh. Having spoken with Jay Fry about this in particular, because it is something that I heard from many Race engineers, drivers, a lot of engineers that were more grumpy than anything, uh, but some drivers as well saying, hey, 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 what's going on here? Um, Wrote a story about the methodology behind this decision to have the big three do the testing. That's on racer.com, so I'd recommend checking that out instead of rehashing the whole thing for you here. Um, I do absolutely believe it's going to create some form of advantage, Josh. What IndyCar has done is said, hey, we're going to invite all the teams to these tests. So we're not keeping anything secret. Come out, check it out, watch, you name it. Then when we're done, we're going to take all the data from the cars, give that to both manufacturers. It's then upon both manufacturers to hand that out to the teams. So what gets gathered in the test per IndyCar will make it to the teams the data coming off of the cars will be shared. So that's really good. So all the teams will have that to work with where I think there's still going to be an advantage is if we talk about these three teams, the fact that they're not only the biggest in the series, but they have very, very powerful and well-developed engineering structures. It's one thing to hand a team data off of a car, Josh. It's another thing to have had your supreme race engineers working with that car, getting the feel from the driver, listening to their interpretation of the handling, the effects of the weight of the aero screen on the front of the car, what it does to the tires, what it does to many things. So downloading data, passing on data, good, super good. That will be a very good thing where I think this is going to give those three uh, a head start is going into the off season where there really be little to no testing 
done by, well, I shouldn't say little to no. There'll be no testing done by the other teams with an aero screen because the aero screens won't be available until some point in December, we're told. And at that point, uh, we're heading into a testing blackout where I think this is going to be a benefit is those three teams will have a couple of months to do more than just look at the data. Really, truly, you know, crunch and analyze the human side of this. Uh, the driver feedback, make the most out of that so that when they're looking at what to do with setups for next year, when they get their own aero screens and go testing, I just have to believe that being the ones with the driver in the car, with the race engineer who knows that driver, knows their nuances, knows the inflections when the driver says this at this volume or raises their voice or lowers it here, some of the little subtleties that if I were listening in on the radio, it might not mean anything to me, but it would to those gathering the information. So, yeah, I'd say there's no way this would not be a bit of an advantage for those teams. Uh, not to counter the argument here, but they this is the big three. <laughs> they already have an advantage. They beat up on the other teams for a variety of reasons. None of them bad. Uh, they're the big three. Uh, I would expect them to be better than the other teams, period. Uh, so doesn't surprise me that they were chosen. Just also won't surprise me if they do a better job next year. And it's not just because they got an early start on the aero screen. It's because aero screen or not, they are going to be the best three teams next year regardless. Uh, as for IndyCar having the resources to eliminate the advantage, I just I don't foresee that happening. I really don't. Uh, of giving the non-testing teams an extra day or whatever it might be at a variety of circuits, I just don't see them making that possible. Jeremy Zucker, you sent in one for both Tim Sindrick and I. I know that Tim Tim tends not to answer these kinds of things, so I saved it for myself. He said, if you had to be stuck on an island with any two Team Penske drivers... One from IndyCar, one from another form of racing. Who would you choose and why? Super easy on the IndyCar side. That would be Rick Mears. I yeah, I love me some Rick Mears. Um, he pulled up and on his scooter and stopped in the paddock today and said hello and chatted a little bit. Uh, we're going to record something, I think, Saturday uh, at Monterey. But I've just... I don't know if Rick feels this way. I wouldn't expect him to. I mean, it's fr Rick frickin' Mears. But I just really love speaking with him. I love our conversations. They're n pretty much never short. They're always some form of in-depth something or other. And it's just a, it's just the best. Any other form of racing? Well, if we're just doing island, fantasy island kind of thing, I'd say Mark Donahue. And I know that he did drive Indy cars for... Roger, but you know, really thinking about him, Formula One, Can-Am, Trans-Am, uh, I tend to think of Mark Moore as a sports car guy. Um, so yeah, it'd be Mark. Just with him as the supreme driver engineer, and at least in my career as a race engineer or assistant race engineer, whatever level of engineer, I would just that's the thing, honestly, I loved most about the job. It really wasn't so much about the car, although that part's really cool. But it's the working with someone to make something better and using math and feel and physics and all that kind of stuff. So that's the thing I would always geek out on with a really good driver. I loved engineering a car because we developed something really cool that could perform. So speaking with someone who really is one of the ongoing blueprints of that amazing driver slash, en slash engineer. Yeah. He'd be marked on a heel all day. Jamie Carr says for the video with Simon Pagano and Ryan, Ryan Blaney, that was awesome. The one that just came out that was, uh, I believe done by NBC sports. Um, it says what do fans need to do to increase the, I guess, amount of those videos just keep voicing it, Jamie. I mean, honestly, the more that NBC, IndyCar, whatever types of racing that you love, it's at the the big dollar and or production level where your opinions move things. Telling a driver to do more of those videos, they're not the ones to commission those things. So 
It's just probably at this stage, nothing more than social media encouragement to whatever broadcaster or series that you really love telling them to do more fun stuff like that. Uh, Jim Kaiser says, Marshall, given his frequently unscheduled and unscripted appearances, have you considered a new show or segment titled Racing with Rocky? That's what about my cat who, or our cat, my wife and I, one of our two cats. Uh, yeah, Rocky loves jumping up when I'm recording and putting his butt in my face. I don't know why. Uh, it's very interesting behavior. He was meowing earlier really loud. Not sure why, but maybe he'll make a guest appearance. For whatever reason, our cat Rosie, she doesn't do that a whole bunch. She does a bunch of other crazy stuff. Uh, she beats up Rocky all the time, which is kind of funny. But, yeah, Rose isn't all about jumping up in the uh, the booty in the face thing. So good on her. Let's go to Mark Cardella. It says, with concerns about weight, driver cooling, vision distortion, rain, etc., is IndyCar considering limiting aero screen implementation in 2020 just to the halo and add the screen in the future? Mark says, hashtag me personally. Great use there. Perfect Marshall Pruitt podcast style guide. Hashtag me personally thinks the halo is ugly. Uh, it's brilliant for open wheel driver safety. So this is an interesting one, Mark, and I'll park here for just a second. So you mentioned with concerns about weight, driver cooling, vision distortion, rain, etc. Is IndyCar considering limiting aero screen implementation? So there's concerns that are real. There are concerns that are based on lack of knowledge. Then there are concerns based on nothing. So I have to quantify what we're talking about here. Concerns about weight, cooling, vision, rain, etc. These aren't things we're hearing coming out of IndyCar saying we have concerns about this. What we have is a lot of fans saying they have concerns or questions about this. No disrespect. Most fans don't possess the knowledge to offer any insightful uh, opinion on this, um, just as I don't have any insightful opinion to offer on the space shuttle and interplanetary travel. Well, um, this is something that most fans honestly have no clue about. Um, so I think there are a lot of folks who voiced a lot of concerns who are basing those concerns on very basic reactions, but not necessarily, uh aha, and I understand the engineering, the physics, the everything else, and I still have those concerns. Uh, I'm a big fan of earned opinions, which you might have heard me mention a few times on the show. Anyone can have an opinion. Uh, I don't respect everybody's opinion. Because if anyone can have one, then how can you respect something that anyone can have about anything? Just as I hope you all don't respect my opinion on things where you say, yeah, Pruitt, you have no idea what you're talking about here, so shut up. Um, this, to me, is something where earned opinions, got it. I'm going to listen to those. Just an opinion? Eh, doesn't really do anything for me. So the concerns part, again, it depends on where it's coming from, Mark. We've heard some drivers, for sure, say, I'm concerned about this, that, and the other. They have voiced those things to the series. To my knowledge, all, almost all, have been heard and received. Doesn't mean that those concerns have necessarily been given answers that make the drivers happy. Keep in mind, it's one of the weird things about concerns. You can express one, and... You might not hear the thing that you want, but it's actually reality or truth. And you just don't go away happy because the thing you wanted to hear, you didn't hear. And you think you should. But sometimes folks go, no, uh, that concern is unfounded. And I, I'm not going to lie to you or just give you something to make you feel happy. You're wrong. In many cases, I don't want to say all, but in many cases, the concerns listed here and some others I do know have been thought through heavily 
and solutions put in place. So I would say no. There's no plans whatsoever by IndyCar to limit anything because concerns have been offered. If they hit something, I would say, Mark, that they would consider a showstopper. Oh, we never thought of this thing. And it's going to make using this a liability. They would absolutely stop. Uh, But just because people voice concerns over something they don't know, they don't understand, aren't directly involved in, aren't sitting in the engineering office working through this with the Red Bull Advanced Technologies team, IndyCar safety team, IndyCar's engineering team, their designers, aerodynamicists, etc. If folks are sitting in on those meetings and coming out saying, hey, we got concerns about weight, cooling, distortion, that's the stuff I need to hear. That's the stuff I want to hear because that's coming from people in the room. Everyone else who's not in the room doesn't understand this stuff, doesn't grasp this stuff. Um, just have to understand that expressing the concern doesn't mean the concern is valid or real. In some cases, some of the things that have been expressed, very valid, very real. IndyCar, to my knowledge, has acted to try and improve those things. All things are still in the prototype phase. So... Everything I know here, Mark, says it's going forward full steam. If they hit problems, I would expect them to stop. But we have yet to turn one lap with this new model on the car. So we'll just say that let's get the thing on the track, put it through some testing, find out if some of these things that they say should be fine aren't fine. Then we definitely have something to talk about beforehand, before then. It's just bench racing. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Winston Penny. Hey, Winston, not sure if I've read a question from you before. So if this is your first one you've sent in, at least thank you. It says, Marshall, maybe I'm biased, but to my mind, too many things are adding up to look like Connor Daly going to Arrow McLaren SP. And he says, I love McLaren too much to call the team spam. Spam, spam, spam. He says, for examples, Connor picked up the four Carlin oval rides and did well. Then Andretti announced the United States air force would be Connor's sponsor at Laguna Seca. He says a possible blocking car for Andretti and Rossi, or am I smelling Zach Brown's money to give Connor a road race trial before the aero SP ride came available before Portland he says, I know Connor has said he'd be talking to Zach and McLaren and Carlin has told him, not to say anything about a possible ride next year. My thoughts and my best wishes to your family. Thank you, Winston. I love some homespun conspiracy theories here. So this is an interesting one, Winston. So Zach Brown is actually paying for Connor possibly at Andretti this weekend, and they've masked it with usaf branding that's that's a good one man i i like to think i can drum up the angles that you you got me whooped on that one i think connor is going to be among the top two or three considered for a seat at spam i think those who readily believe that james hinchcliffe will be in one of their cars would say continue to keep that belief on hold. Might happen, but yeah, um, don't 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 pencil or don't write him in there in permanent ink. Definitely, there's one seat available, maybe two. I know Marcus Erickson is still quote a possibility there. Don't think that's going to happen. Had a nice conversation with Marcus today, by the way. I would I would say there could be something here. There's another team as well that I'm aware of, and I'm not mentioning them on purpose, so ask not to. Not everything that I'm told is meant to be revealed uh, at any point, at any and every point in time. I know there's another team that is actively speaking with Connor about making something happen, and if that does come to pass, I think he'd be in really amazing amazing 
space, frankly, something that could really boost his career. But I just have a, I have a good feeling like you, Winston, that there could be something very positive on the horizon, at least getting a little bit closer, something for Connor. Uh, I do believe that the United States Air Force said that they would be doing some support here towards the end of the year, and this was announced a while ago, well before the spam thing came together. But nonetheless, we'll go with the Zach Brown uh, angle here for sure. But, yeah, I, I would certainly say I'm feeling more positive about Connor being a full-time IndyCar driver since any point after the Foyt thing was just uh yeah a dumpster fire for sure that really ruined his career at least at that point in time and also jack hawksworth let's see let's go to ron thompson says have you guys asked trevor carlin about billy monger and if he would like to race in the states says hashtag me personally believes he'd be a nice addition and it definitely looks like he has a talent to start in indy lights yes ron if you go back if you visit our marshallprotpodcast.com site and use the little search option on the top right and type in Trevor Carlin, you'll be able to pull up the episode, whatever is the most recent episode. It might have been late last year, early this year. I'm not 100%, uh, but this was a question that I threw at him about Billy, and he said yes, he would absolutely love to bring him here over to the States and race. Just a question of who would pay for it. So... Yeah, I think Billy would be amazing. Um, I just, yeah, I would think it'd be even more amazing if someone put some money behind him. Let's go to Bob Fay. He says, Marshall, I've been sending you music ideas from my alter ego on Twitter. You mentioned listening to Dokken, and I sent a tweet about the end machine, basically the musicians in Dokken with a new singer, Robert Mason. Did you ever check them out? They kick ass. I did not. I think I missed that tweet. And there's another thing to mention here. Uh... Of late, I've done my best to keep up on social media, but I'm sure some of you have sent me things either just straight up publicly or even email or DM. And uh, yeah, if I haven't gotten back to you, it's it, no disrespect. Um, and if I missed the thing you sent, like this one, Bob, uh, just apologize. Uh, he also said Durand Jones and the indications, proper R&B. Check them out. I did listen to a little bit of that, Bob. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounded very kind of modern hipster version of R and B. Um, I have lots and lots of, I guess I would say original R and B that I might suggest or that I would listen to first. So happy to share some band names if desired there. See, we don't just talk about racing here. We talk about who knows what I'm going to jump to a whole series of questions sent in on the IndyCar Reddit group. So thanks, you all, for taking the time here. And uh, I do love the fact that we have good stuff coming in. Thanks to Matt for assembling these and emailing them over. So let me get rolling here. Going to go with Joseki 100 uh, Talking about spam. He says, do you expect them to announce the 2019... <sighs> I'm going to, I am genuinely, I'm not going to edit this out. I'm just going to take a sip of coffee here because I need to. It's 1049. 7-Eleven coffee. It gets no better. Do you expect them to announce the 2019 lineup all at once? Hashtag me personally. And I'm just, I need to tell you, I love you guys for just embracing the hashtag me personally. It's my pet peeve and it just makes me smile when you throw it back. It, it, truly it does it says hashtag me personally i think they will wait for the f1 grand pricks at coda to announce the two full-time seats and triple f that being my nickname for fernando alonso fast effing fernando in the third car for the indy 500 i would say mr or mrs joseki 100 or it they, them, I'm, I'm still not clear on the pronoun thing. Um, if I was the good old media strategist here, I would not announce all at once. Uh, I would certainly think that 
Fernando for the 500 would be something that the longer I wait, maybe the better. Uh, I would say that at least in terms of a bigger team like this and its strategery, although they do it in F1 where you often get both drivers announced at the same time, I'd say here it wouldn't be a bad thing to confirm one unless it was something strange. Um, meaning, hey, everyone's wondering if James Hinchcliffe is truly going to drive for the team. So if they announce James Hinchcliffe first, I think that'd be just fine. Normally what you're looking for, at least in IndyCar, knowing that its media presence is not massive, the more things like this you can break up into individual announcements to get people to keep coming back, uh, show continue continual bumps in traffic uh the somewhat normal formula is great i'm just randomly picking on october 1st we're going to announce driver one assuming that you have the other driver in place we're going to do that november something maybe our 500 program comes in and around uh december maybe wait till january new year february who knows um i would say it would surprise me if they announced everything at once just because that just tends not to be the way that teams view media opportunities stretch it out do as many individual hits as you can show your partners and sponsors that see we have some form of sustained interest from folks let's see what else Uh, a couple other aspects here to joe secchi 100's question few people left the team after the spam announcement where the change is part of the deal is it part of mclaren's plan to improve the team with the influx of extra cash by hiring more qualified personnel so there's a story i'd love to tell you truly it's one of the funniest things it's funny not funny it's hilarious but it's not because there's some real human capital involved here um i'm hoping to be able to to tell it to you next week i need to i should ask i don't have to but again this paddock is where i work and you know if i said everything i know if every reporter said everything they know no one would talk to us so although i'm sure i could probably tell the story now which addresses the question here let me just i'm gonna get a feeling get get a feeling so don't be afraid to remind me Knowing that next week we are moving, uh, my wife's in theory is being discharged on Friday next week. I'm going to do my best to get some sort of week in IndyCar Q&A going. It might run late. It might run late into the week. It might be a weekend thing. I don't know. But don't hesitate to remind me uh, with a question, you know, with a question here. Hey, idiot, did you check in? Tell us the story. Um. There is something that went down that certainly caused to at least one parting of ways, if not two. And yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Ah, it's a good one. So please remind me. I hope I can tell it next week. Third aspect of the question here. Sam Schmidt really wanted the media to know that McLaren didn't buy the team. But from the outside, it's hard not to read the recent news about the team as McLaren assuming at least partial control over the team really great distinctions made here um i had someone today tell me um i spoke with so and so at portland uh with one of the i think maybe even sam and he told me that mclaren did not buy any stake in the team so i had that on the record i was trying to be polite and said yeah i wrote that uh, at the beginning of whatever it was in august in the release that came out that they came out and in what I added into what I wrote there, I mean, it was clear as day then. So there's nothing new here. Truly nothing new. McLaren has not purchased one tenth of one percent of Schmidt Peterson Motorsports. They're certainly investing a lot of money, though. They are bringing their equipment, their two cars, their you name it, adding that in to what the team has an inventory they're bringing from what i understand very strong sponsorship they also have a very strong sponsorship with a uh, relationship with arrow 
So while the McLaren racing outfit does not own one iota of the team they are partnering with, and although Taylor Kyle is the general manager of that program, so it is managed, owned, all of those things by, just say, SPM, it's hard to ignore the fact that McLaren has partnered with them, is bringing a lot of money, is bringing cars and assets to this. And I've had some folks tell me, oh, well, you know, SPM, they're going to make all the decisions on drivers and everything else. Really? <laughs> I'm not saying they won't have a definite involvement and a big role, but if anybody thinks that McLaren is bringing a bunch of sponsorship and cars and you name it and saying, just let us know who you picked and tell us when to show up. Gosh, this will be fun. Do we get jackets? Do we get shirts and hats? Um, <laughs> you don't have to buy a percentage of a team in order to have influence or control over things. Um, the question that I've posed a number of times and will continue to pose, and it is not said with any disrespect I don't know how long this dynamic is going to function because McLaren is not an organization that, as I see it, will for many years live in this weird friend zone. <laughs> it's kind of what it is living in the friend zone. It's not fully consummated. There's some whatever going on, but it's not theirs. I don't know how long that will last. I do believe by 2021, 22, I fully expect McLaren to be its own independent organization. Uh, knowing that they are very close with Aero, I don't know what that might mean for the future. Whether Aero could be, quote, McLaren sponsor, if McLaren could be running the whole thing. I mean, if Aero is the money that makes SPM function right now, McLaren's bringing money. Arrow is potentially looking to McLaren to be kind of the, the, the binding agent that makes all this stuff happen. Despite who might own which cars, despite who might be paying the lease on the shop, you know, if the folks bringing the money and the other, the main sponsor that's aligned now with the people who are bringing the money, are the folks bringing the money? That's a lot of leverage. So it's different from who's running the day-to-day, -day, who's hiring and firing, who is sending the cars here, there. You know, I think this is, it's an interesting, it's an interesting experiment. I don't know if the experiment is going to succeed, but I do know that while McLaren doesn't own one penny of the team they're working with for the money they're bringing and the assets, Jill DeFerrin coming in uh, to be a leader from the McLaren side, at least all of those things add up to, we have a seat at the table and a voice in the voting and decision-making where that plays out. Is it truly between Schmidt Peterson and McLaren is it one-third an equal split among the three on everything in terms of decision-making? Don't know. I just don't discount the fact that the money seems to be, which is coming from two angles, uh, those two seem to be buddy-buddy, and that should not be ignored. Let's go to my favorite Reddit Screen name. I forgot my password. Okay. Uh, he says, hey, Marmar. That's the first one. I don't think I've ever been called Marmar before. Uh, if you're going to play Dungeons and Dragons with three folks from the paddock, who would fill out your party? Who would run the game? So I love this question because as a, I don't know, 10-year-old, 11-year-old, something in that range, 
uh, pre high school, I believe I played Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I don't, I wouldn't know what to do with it today, but at least for a period, I really loved it. So, um, yeah, that's a boy, that's a great one. Uh, Jeremy Millis comes to mind, Alexander Rossi's race engineer. Really funny, really brilliant. Um, I think he'd just be a hoot. Uh, he'd probably also just win everything. All right, who else? Who uh, Zach Veach strikes me as someone who might have played Dungeons & Dragons on his own at some point. Um, so that would be my second. So I've got a driver... We've got a race engineer. Who who else? I I would pick Towny Bell. I'd go with Townsend. First of all, too cool of a guy, I'm sure, to have ever played Dungeons and Dragons. But so anal that I mean, we uh, he would be fuming mad, getting so mad over any little discrepancy, any little anything. I just, yeah, he would be fun to watch. Pull the pin on Towney. He, and Jeremy is the type where if he sees that, I mean, I'm the same way, but Jeremy as well. The minute you expose your belly a little bit and start getting agitated, for oh, yeah, that's just an invitation to just needle and attack until you storm off. So, yeah, that'd be my three. Let's see. Let's go to user OSFN8. I was reading the IndyCar rule book as a normal person typically does and saw a rule about car names being required for each entrant. What do the teams do with names? Do they just do something like F1 teams, VF-19, FW42, etc.? Or is it something more fun like Rossi's, quote, baby girl? Um, the car names, it's, it's just more the official entry name, to my knowledge. I mean, granted, the Delara is a DW12. They all use them. They're the spec, so there's no real naming being done by the team. I could be misinterpreting your question because I don't have the rule number in front of me to look up, but uh, I'm wondering if you're referring to kind of the entry name, which is kind of an old IndyCar convention of the such-and-such special or the whatever else. So I do like the idea, though, of baby girl being some sort of bet that you win or lose, you know, if Rossi, maybe if, he, if Rossi wins a bet, say against new garden, new garden has to enter his car. Although he doesn't do it. The team does, but baby girl needs to be listed in the official entry. That'd be a blast. And then here, of course, because I didn't read all the way down. And right now you're saying Pruitt, you're an idiot more than you normally would. You include the rule. And it fully explains your car names. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it just refers to the entry name here. So, yeah. Um, I should read the whole thing before I respond. Sorry. It's on the next page. Uh, yeah. I do think the teams could have fun with this, but it does just tend to be pretty much straightforward stuff. Uh, I can tell you that you know, again, from past experience, there are sponsors who are aware of this and those who aren't and the ones who are absolutely ask for it every time. Oh, we need our name in the, the official entry name. And so I think one of one back in the old IRL days was we had this sponsor. I think it was Dixie Chopper, a lawn mower, riding lawn mower thing, something like that. And I think they were putting in twenty five grand for the Indy five hundred. At least back then, it cost ten times that, if not more, to run. We were a small team; we could do it on on pennies. But still, the Dixie Chopper folks, knowing that we needed, we we're broke, uh, contributed. I think twenty five grand. Very helpful. No, again, nothing, nothing bad to say here. But they also were looking to gouge any and every little thing they could to get out of us for that money acting like which you often have the associate sponsors tend to act like their primary sponsors far more than the primary sponsors do. And so one thing that the guy was demanding was the name in the entry portion 
So when you look on the entry list, you see it's the such and such team, this, and I believe their convention for their name and logo was all caps. So, and there was some other extra thing too. Dixie chopper made by this, that, and the other, and the other thing, and that thing, 4,000 letters long, all caps, all just obscene, but for their 25 grand man, they were not going to let loose on that. Of course they had space on the car and the, this and the, that, but yeah. Uh, when you see folks who find the money in IndyCar and they look kind of worn out, <laughs> it's usually not, Hey, Rocky just jumped up. You're going to walk by or is it ass time? Oh, you're going to walk by. Look at that. Good Lord. Uh, who knows what's going on here tonight? Uh, it's usually because not, because they've been searching so hard and they're worn out it's because some of the smaller sponsors just wear them out completely over little stuff like this let's go to s no j sudbury there we go i'm getting liz dexic a little bit later in the evening here it says i saw a couple weeks back graham ray hall had post post posed posed a pick sure he posed a pick from the HBD simulator with his steering wheel. Are all drivers able to carry their specific wheel to Sims? Does it also mean they would be getting, quote, real data readouts like they would see in the actual car? Um, I would say it would be unexpected for drivers to bring their race car's steering wheel to a simulator session. Um might be a case where the wheel used by hpd and their sim is made by the same people that there are a couple of vendors in indycar could be a same same matchy matchy thing um as for data readouts i don't know how much time a driver like graham would be spending looking at the steering wheel uh during a sim session like this in the same way that he would in the race car. I'm sure he would, obviously, but I don't know how much they would look to try and replicate it exactly. Um, And as for the data being the real thing or the same like they would in a race car, absolutely. Um, This is, yeah. In the sim, they're getting data provided just as if he was on the racetrack itself. So pretty amazing stuff. Let's get to Lord of the Tires. He says, with the Brickyard 400 providing the war chest to win the IRL and cart war, as Rocky jumps down and knocks stuff over, what are IMS's options to keep the IMS revenue up while IndyCar works its way back into the black with the Brickyard 400 attendance being so average? Um... I'm not sure I totally see the angle here on this question, to be honest. Lord of the Tires. Uh, I would say the Indy 500 certainly was just as big, if not a bigger contributor, if we're talking war chest during the split. Um, I believe that IMS is doing a variety of interesting things to host other racing series and use the facility for more concerts and other things to keep their revenue at a happy place while the 400 revenue, it looks like, continues to go down. So I would say that's nothing new. Uh, the attendance has been going down for a while, and it just seems like Doug Bowles and his team running IMS have been searching for more and new and interesting ways to get revenue coming in from other things instead of just having these two big events per year that seeded uh, everything they needed in terms of money. Let's see. Uh, let's go to user Bob dash four dash five dash. I have a quick question for you. I was recently chatting with someone I know who was involved with an IndyCar team. And I asked that individual their thoughts on the Hinchcliffe and spam situation because Everything has been a little odd, in my opinion. Anyway, this individual told me that they would not be surprised if it was announced that Hinch was joining a Honda-powered team next year, like Ray Hall, Edelman, Lanigan, and that Zach Brown and Spam would buy out the last year of his contract. 
In addition, this person mentioned to me that their driver lineup next year would shock some people, as in a driver none of us are thinking about on the IndyCar side of things. What are your personal thoughts on this, Marshall? You and Robin touched on it a little bit last week. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this situation going into the season finale. He says, thank you. I'm always keeping you and your wife in my thoughts. So that's really sweet of you. I'm going to give you my personal thoughts compared to my impersonal thoughts. Yep, this is a scenario that uh, I believe Robin's mentioned in print, in video. Uh, I'm sure I've mentioned it as well. Maybe not from the um, Zach Brown spam would buy out the last year of his contract so much. Uh, knowing that Honda is very interested in Hinch. Honda Canada, but I think also HPD as well. Um, keep in mind that for McLaren SP spam to get out of their Honda contract a year early, it costs some money. Um, they had to buy their way out of that. Could that be money to then reapportion to help Hinch at an RLL or name another Honda power team? I think that might be the angle we're talking about. Uh, being most realistic if that were to happen. As for a shocking driver, yeah, I mean, I don't, there's none that come to mind that I know of that I would say, oh my goodness. And again, who knows? Maybe I'm, I will be shocked. I think it could be someone who's unexpected, but not, you know, Nigel Mansell has come out of retirement to drive for spam. That'd be kind of fun. Uh, All right, we're getting to the close here of our Reddit questions, and then I'm going to jump into a few more, as many as I can. I'm going to give myself about another 15, 17 minutes. Then I'm going to go lay down and go to sleep because I have to get up early in the morning and do this over again. Uh, We're going to go to Timely Tough 7. What is the likelihood that Pato Award comes back to IndyCar next year, even if it's for a few races? I would say it all depends on Red Bull. Our young Mexican badass. I think he's been doing well in his kind of odd late season move to the Super Formula based on Red Bull funding that. It's really going to come down to Red Bull deciding whether they want to keep him as a young driver, move him to something in Europe or not. If Red Bull says thanks but no thanks, I definitely think he could be on someone's radar in IndyCar. Totally a matter of timing, though. Uh, If this is something where come December Red Bull makes a decision, I don't really believe there's going to be anything for Pato uh, to make use of and use next year. It would have to be someone into 2020 saying, Hey, okay, what are we going to do? Do we have a little bit of money? we got to honor this leader circle contract of ours. Who could we put in? That's pretty good. Uh, honestly, the best thing for Pato is for Red Bull to say, we love you. We're keeping you. We're going to keep developing you. If they decide to not do that, the other best thing would be for them to come to that realization quickly so he can get back on the radar here. And granted, I know that he has spoken with a team or two. I know that because I have spoken with him recently, and we have discussed that just in terms of maintaining relationships, uh, not hedging his bets that things won't work out, but it'd be silly not to. Uh, so, yeah, whatever it is, timing is, is really the critical component we are looking at here and just for those who care i'm sure most of you don't but i'm having fun with rocky walking back and forth and the bowl that i had my dinner in he's walking over and trying to put his nose into so i'll pick it up and move it to the other side of the desk and then he'll walk across me and try and do that there so i'm playing keep away with rocky dude i've fed you twice today remotely using my phone leave me alone Anyways, seriously, this is my life. I'm sorry. I feel I feel the need to say I'm sorry because I'm currently playing keep away with a mostly empty bowl with an eight-year-old cat who could just give zero craps about the fact that we're trying to talk IndyCar 
at 11.15 on a Thursday night. Dude, leave me alone. You got kibble breath, too. All right, we're going to go. Where are we going to go? I'm not sure because Rocky just scrolled the whole screen. You're killing me. All right, let's go to where are we going to go? I don't know. Um, Joey Bacon. We've heard about IMSA's Felipe Nasr and Colin Brown exploring IndyCar options, but are any other big sports car names looking to make the switch soon? Hashtag me personally. I'd like to see Jonathan Bomarito. And now Rocky's going to just start knocking things off the desk. Dude, for real. I love you. You're my guy. Okay? Can you just give me a break here? No, and get your damn nose out of my bowl. (laughs) I do need to start a segment, apparently. Cat's behaving badly. All right. Um, You'd like to see Jonathan Bomarito mainly because I want to see Bomarito race. In the Bomarito Automotive Group 500 at Gateway. Well, I mean, that makes total sense. So you ask the question. I will answer it. Not well, but I will answer it. Haven't heard any other sports car names in terms of drivers exploring IndyCar options. There is a fascinating one, though, that I know about from the team side. Got to leave it at that have to leave it at that but yeah and there is a specific team in the indicar paddock that i will be discussing this with over the weekend because i think that there could be a very strong relationship they could forge so leave that here for now but yeah joey might not be in the driver front felipe by the way spent about a half hour with him at the imsa race last weekend in monterey catching up Finally got the in-person download on the test that he did at Mid-Ohio with almost spam, Aero SPM. Um, I guess it is spam as well, but I tend to think that when I think of the M and spam, I think of McLaren. Um, Didn't go super well. His lap times were a decent bit off of the Alex Palou kid who tested for coin. And so I know that some who have seen those lap times have been saying, oh, yeah, see, that guy's trash. That, you know, that's why he's not in the series. He was slow, you see. And it's like, no, 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 no. Um, Monster in the junior formulas was really fast in Formula One in a car that wasn't very fast. So we know speed's not the issue. It's really interesting to get the download from him as to why, what went on during the test, and to walk away going, Oh, okay. Yeah, that does make sense. Um, wasn't a test to find out how fast he was. It was truly a test to use him, well known for his technical acumen, to work through a lot of changes and try and find things that might help the team go faster. So, uh, yeah, on the Collins side, I I have a feeling that might be slipping away a little bit. I think there might have to be a pretty big bump in sponsor support very quickly for that to still be a thing. I've heard some very positive things for Colin on the sports car front, but yeah, I think the IndyCar window might be getting a little bit tough for next season for him here. Uh, Let's see. Let's go to Insomniac 1995. Said, first off, I really enjoyed last week's episode with Robin Miller. I really believe that IndyCar fans ask some of the best hard-hitting questions when it comes to wanting to know what's going on within any sport out there. I honestly cannot disagree. Uh, The questions that you all send in every week when I tell you guys, you guys, these are great questions, amazing questions. I'm not just pulling that stuff out of my butt. It's not like I have it written down to repeat every week, say the questions are good. Really, they're great, and I really enjoy them, and the vast majority Uh, are fun and or some of them just make me laugh and so thank you for that um let's go here we've got a couple things in here for us monsieur or mrs insomniac um go here with the uh, one about want to get your thoughts on this topic what's the status between napa auto parts and rossi moving forward uh post next year okay 
I know that Napa is splitting and sharing their time with AutoNation for 2020, but how does the rest of his contract work out with sponsors down the line, considering he signed a three-year extension with Andretti Autosport? So this is one of those things where you got a really great question, and I'd really love to give you a really great answer, but you also have to understand they don't show us their contracts. So I can't exactly tell, you know, nor would they answer. So I, it's a great question, just one of those ones that you can't get an answer to because they don't give us this information because some of it, in this case, is very private. From what I understand, the Auto Nation support should be something that continues uh, for a couple of years. So in announcing a multi-year deal and in naming a couple of sponsors for it, uh, you would just have to assume that it's not just for next year, but something that has been mapped out for multi-year. But in terms of how it works out with other sponsors and et cetera, honestly couldn't tell you because that's just not something that they tend to share with us. Um, Let's go to... Yamasa, Yamasa. I have no idea. Two L's and A and M, three A's and S, and two more A's. Um, that might break my word talking mouth understanding. Uh, starts off by saying your podcast always gives me a smile whenever it pops up on my phone. As one day a week, I get to listen to you talk about IndyCar while I do my work for the day. Thanks for all that you do. Well, that was really that was really sweet says, I'm not sure if this was asked or discussed within the last few weeks, but I wanted to get your opinion and thoughts on the mixed reactions from some motorsport media types on social media. For example, Jenna Fryer, Kenny Wallace, to name a few, on IndyCar's 2020 schedule. Why is it that some of these people feel the need to publicly put down and shame other motorsports? Doesn't it just make them look worse than what they are saying? Um interesting one here i know jenna don't claim to know her well respect jenna know of kenny as a race car driver don't know him at all never met the guy um as for why yeah i mean i i would say for sure i have seen a number of things from jenna over the years that crap on IndyCar. I don't know why. I wouldn't say that crapping on IndyCar is a bad thing. If she looks at something and says, I don't like that, and based on my experience in the sport and my knowledge and whatnot, that thing they're doing, whatever it is, uh, in this case, if it's the 2020 schedule, and I find flaws in it and want to say so, I don't don't think there's anything to talk about or say just like if i see it and say oh that's great i love the schedule that also is nothing it's just my opinion in reading something and that's that Uh, of course i would love someone like jenna who has a massive amount of influence and reach uh, someone who works for the associated press Of course, I'd love to hear her say everything about IndyCar is amazing at all points in time. That'd be stupid. That'd be totally unrealistic. Um, I don't know. Uh, The why don't other people, why don't other reporters say more positive things question does get raised a fair amount. I would also say that, to my knowledge, Jenna is a straight-up, standard reporter meaning someone who comes to her profession as a straight up reporter Uh, this is her chosen discipline but this is what i know of jenna and so i'm not claiming that could be totally false i come to this from a completely non-straight up direction Uh, would say inferior to a Jenna uh, or others who are classically trained, if that's the right way to phrase things. 
I come to this from the paddock as a mechanic, as of this, working my way up. This has been my life's passion, this series in particular. I know that I cover sports cars as well, also a passion. But IndyCar, really and truly my very first passion. And so that's the passion that fuels and sustains everything that I do. And it's now, I don't even know, 30-something years So for me, I probably view things in a less critical manner. I try to remind myself to be critical. I just maybe don't see as many negatives as others. I'm also definitely a glass half full guy. Definitely a positive person by nature. So some of these things might contribute to not criticizing as many things as another reporter who either doesn't come to this say from the paddock or isn't necessarily a glass half full person uh, might be tending to share those things that they see and want to point out the negatives so i don't know um i don't see anything i don't really see a lot of social media these days that doesn't involve the direct things coming from you all. But I know that Jenna writes a lot of things. I know that she gets a lot of crap. I know that being a woman in this space and sharing opinions seems to be for some of the most idiotic men in the world, something that just is intolerable. And she, you know, she is a tough woman. Thankfully, you would have to be uh, to be a woman with an opinion, with the full right to say whatever she wants, just as anyone else has the right to say what they want in her profession. Um, she gets, <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's sad. It, it's it's truly disappointing to see the kind of treatment she gets just for she being a she. Um, How's this? (laughs) If I got the kind of heat that she does for saying whatever it is that I say, simply because I was a man, I would probably quit at some point in time. Um, I cannot claim for my, my inner constitution to be as strong as hers or many women who put up with idiotic men in a profession or a sport or whatever that is largely male driven. So not, defending anything not whatever just stating that i've seen a couple things where it seemed i read and jenna ripped indycar apart on something and i didn't see the angle i didn't understand it i've also seen her write some really awesome things too um in theory that's the way this stuff works out balance Uh, if you see someone tip totally in one direction or mostly in one direction yeah maybe ask some questions i haven't seen that but maybe you have so um All I can tell you is if whatever she is saying or Kenny Wallace or whomever else, if whatever they're saying is coming from a genuine place, that's all I can really ask for because we certainly seem to live in an era where opinions, especially those that I told you I dislike the most, the unearned opinions, just I had a thought and I said it. That's my opinion and it matters because I said it. No, Um, that seems to be a lot of what we get today when we turn on the TV in particular. Most, uh, whether it's ESPN, Fox Sports, whatever, just it's talking heads constantly. And I never really believe that most of the folks doing the talking believe half of what they're saying, if most of it. So if Jenna's saying something that's critical, Kenny is saying something that's critical, and they believe it, and they, it's truly coming from a solid place, I mean, that's the way, that's how this stuff works. Cool. You spoke your truth. Uh, might not be the one that I like. It might not be my truth, but good on you. I appreciate that. Instead of just saying something that's going to inflame for the sake of and nothing more. Let's see. Going to wind down here, and I should be shutting things off right about now. Um Kyle Brown, what's the over-under in three and a half? 
There's the over under three and a half crash cars in the Andretti hairpin on lap one of Laguna. Yeah, if there aren't three, three tends to be what what I would say for sure. I think you're you're pretty darn close there. Um, Jameen Tuttle asks about Laguna and how the least little off track excursion sends a lot of dirt and dust everywhere. Um, are there any modifications done to protect the engines? Yes, they all have significant air filters uh, leading into the turbochargers. So, yes, absolutely. Simon Roffey says, what is stopping Michigan getting back in the calendar? IndyCar needs another super speedway after Pocono has been dropped. I agree on the super speedway. Same answer as always, Simon. The track saying, IndyCar, we want you to race here, and here is the money we're going to pay you to do that. Apply that to any track we're not going to. Why aren't we going there? Because they haven't offered the money for that to happen. Um, Simon also says, how much of the current IndyCar is built in America? And does much of it come from Delar's home in Italy? Could be wrong on this. Maybe some things have changed. But to my knowledge, the large carbon fiber parts, the tub in particular, comes from Delara in Italy. I would say a lot of the body work, I believe suspension and some other items are manufactured in Speedway. So, yeah, the really big autoclavy pieces, Italy and the other bits, I believe, are here in good old America. Um, Don Gregory, curious how many people in the paddock talking about the development of the new 2022 IndyCar, uh, how many folks would prefer multiple chassis manufacturers? Little note I'll throw in here, Don, in that one hour sit down with Jay Fry today in his office. It's a little, little surprised when I heard uh, there maybe don't put 22 as the guaranteed year for a completely new indie car parts of it new some of it new uh, engine we know that'll be new but brand new vehicle for 22 mm, seems like that's still not fully baked in yet as for teams preferring multiple manufacturers i think it just it's always an age thing don if you've been around for a little while you remember the days where there were multiple manufacturers. You probably have folks who long for those days. For the other half who are post-multiple in just spec era, I mean, hard to long for something you never had. Let's see. Um, Greg Fetchick, yes, a question about concrete racing surface. And asphalt and why concrete's always mentioned as being more slippery. Um, again, just talking about the materials being used being the answer, Greg. Uh, if we're talking asphalt, you can use a lot of different things. The aggregate that is made, the aggregate that's used, but it tends to be a little, call it just spiky. And at least concrete, as I have always seen, uh, has been almost blemish free or close to blemish free. It's not something that has, it's made of something that has little things that poke up and would help grab a tire, give a tire something to dig into to create traction. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the cement at least certainly something that uh, does not necessarily contribute to that in any way that I can think of. Um, Paolo Mendioro, you ask, if a current IndyCar NASCAR team could get an accurate DPI, like Tim Sindrick's team runs, who would I like to see? Huh. I don't know about NASCAR. I'm not a NASCAR guy, to be honest, so that's something where I could not give you an answer that didn't suck. And You might hear my mouse clicking in the background because my silent mouse is actually giving me the silent treatment. Uh, it's acting weird. Uh, let's see. Team. IndyCar team, I'd like to see get a hold of an Acura ARX 05 DPI. I mean, if I'm just having nostalgic feelings, it'd be Andretti Autosport because I saw them do amazing things with an Acura LMP2 car. Beyond that, 
I know that there's an ongoing effort, and I know that they're Chevy, so this isn't necessarily an accurate thing, but Ed Carpenter Racing and Sports Car, love to see that. Um, boy, I don't think spam, I just don't think that's right for spam right about now. You know, here's an answer, and it's a bad one, but it's mine, therefore it's bad. Harding Steinbrenner Racing, I'd love to see them yeah, I'd love to see some money come along for them to run an Acura prototype. Uh, keep hearing from, you know, I'm going to get some more information here shortly, but keep hearing things that make me worry about that team's ability to keep going. Um, yeah, so that's one I'd like to hear just so they can make sure that they uh, are doing something next year. That would be... Pretty, pretty awesome. And let me get down to the last one or two. I should have stopped already, but uh, it's okay. Actually, we're not too far from being done. Oh, my goodness. This is amazing. Either that or I just scrolled through a bunch and didn't notice. I apologize. All right, Nathan Barnt, you sent in two that are actually there by last two. All right, I'm just going to do these. Uh, Another repeat from last week. He says, in response to two weeks ago, exploration of potential penalties for earning the golden bowling ball. I had an idea. While fines are likely ineffectual in good positions, unwieldy, why not consider docking championship points? Um, you go on to offer a few more things here on that subject. I really like that idea, Nathan. I, I like that one. I might like that one most of all because it... It hits at a place of pride, right? I mean, if you look at the points right now, going into this weekend's season finale at Monterey, there are a number of drivers who are just seething at where they're sitting in the standings, knowing that most likely they're not going to make a huge move in any direction that's super positive. There are a number of drivers who are just like, man, this ugh, hate where they are and feel like they should be in a better place. Things went wrong this season. Often when we talk about the things that went wrong, and this is where I love this idea of yours, Nathan. When we talk about the things that went wrong, it's my motor blew up, tire exploded, brakes fell off, <laughs> that guy over there hit me. If you remove all those things, I oh boy, I'd have the bestest season ever. I like the idea of, yeah, if that other guy hadn't hit you at this race, you'd have more points. You'd be further up in the standings. But you remember that time when you took out half the field at wherever? Yeah. So you're that guy for everyone else talking about their bad season because you took them out here. Um I like the idea of saying, oh, and you know what? Actually, you can't just blame bad luck and mechanical stuff and that time you got taken out or the three times you were hit. You're also where you are because of your mistakes, because they docked five points, ten points, whatever the number is. I almost wonder if it should be a sliding scale. Five points per car affected, ten points? I don't know. Could a driver actually leave a race with negative points earned, right? Not for the non-double points, it's 50 points to win. <laughs> Again, I don't know, you know, if we go five points per car, you take out, if it's seven, eight, ten, whatever. But could you imagine someone who, you know, takes out six cars in a giant bowling ball moment and actually leaves the race, not just being docked points for making that happen, but actually, no, you actually did not just, fail to earn points you actually are in a deficit at the end of this race for the damage you did i i kind of like that that direction here nathan i really do because this one is something where you go yeah, all right uh you don't just get to walk away you don't just get to apologize on social media um of course there's a penalty there's a financial one right tore up a bunch of stuff gotta fix that pay for that somehow usually it's not the drivers that pay for it but still Um, you know, it hurts pissed off your team. They got a bunch of extra work to do. Um, I like this one where you go, all right, you directly pay for this. You 
fall down a little bit in the championship. And guess what? The next time you do this, you're going to fall down even further. And so not only does this hit at the pride angle, also potentially, depending on how contracts might be written, could this affect your income, right? You get paid X amount or a bonus if you finish inside the top 10, top 8, top whatever, and because of your bad decisions, you're now, I don't know, 12th, 15th in the standings at the end of the year. Um, you know, again, this wouldn't necessarily be super easy to judge, right? There would be certainly some arbitrary things where you go, Hey, this guy squeezed me. That's why I hit the other guy. And yeah, I know I'm the one who triggered the whole crash, but see how he moved. Then I moved then whatever. I mean, there would certainly be some serious upsetness here, but I like the direction you're taking us. I think it needs to be explored. I think also, if any of you have a little bit of time, you might pick a driver who we think of as kind of accident prone and see how this formula would work. If you count the cars that they've taken out this year and apply, I don't know, a five point per car scale, maybe then eight points, maybe even 10, just see how how badly would affect their season. That'd be really interesting to hear. And I also just realized that I gave someone homework potentially. So, um, yeah. All right. Uh, going to go to the final question here sent in again uh, from Nathan Barnt. says, maybe an opportunity for a little bit of the mold soapbox. Mold being our fine brand new fake sponsor, Miller's, Robin Miller's outdated LED depot. Mold, the finest depot for outdated IndyCar led panels nathan says less of a question but a little more insight on the sim game simulation indycar gaming front while indycar doesn't have an official esports platform they do have content within several simulators it says project cars 2 has a 2016 spec lard w12 both manufacture aero kits speedway and road course it says i racing has the ir18 even recently updated with the afp Although they don't present a manufacturer officially, the rear brake ducts and tailpipes seem to indicate they scanned a Chevy. They run three official four points and rankings in iRacing series. They have a fixed setup oval only series and an open setup series spanning ovals and road courses, both running one hour, one pit stop races every two hours. In addition, the IndyCar iRacing series runs full length or nearly full length races on Saturdays, the week before the real series visits. Any given track in the schedule, provided it's in the simulation. Let's see. Finally, they also run a full 8500 event during the month of May that gets hundreds, if not thousands, of entries split into fields of 33, of course. In addition to all that, iRacing has the originally DW12, a 2008-era Delara, that have been presented in the simulation, present in the simulation much longer, although these haven't had official series for quite some time. Nathan closes by saying, hashtag me personally. Thank you, Nathan. Not a replacement for a full official cross-platform mass market game, but it does show that there is potential for official esports events right now if the series wanted to pursue it. 100% with you here as well, Nathan. I have been aware of some of what you've mentioned, not all, so thank you for getting me up to speed in the areas where I was ignorant Definitely good to know that fans of the series that love sim games, gaming in general, have options. The obvious point you are making, and I think we continue to make, is we're going to run out (laughs) of competitors that have gotten to this before IndyCar, by the time IndyCar gets there. I mean... Are we talking electric rally cars? Are good? I mean, is that going to be the one series that IndyCar beats? And I'm, you know, I'm not trying to be mean to IndyCar here, but it's like, come on, come on! If you took this ser- if you took this as seriously as we believe you should, um, man, eh. what's the thing we try and fight with IndyCar? And maybe this is the mold soapbox item. What's the thing we're constantly trying to fight with IndyCar? 
the perception that it is an old, hey, my grandpa used to like that. It's an old timey thing. It's fighting for those again, who, for those of us who've been around for a little while, who saw it during its heyday, then seen it decline heavily. It's a fight. Say, no, no, no. It's still good. It's still new and real. There's young talent and the cars look so much better. And we go to great places and all these things. We've got a great TV package. Don't discount it as just some old thing. Your grandpa used to watch. So here's a prime opportunity for IndyCar to modernize itself. It keeps trying to court a younger demographic. That's great. How then do you fight to be relevant? Do you fight to be in the game, still seen as something that's cool and just amazing and unique? How do you fight to stay away from irrelevance? old timey and dusty and smelly and dingy and ah, some old kind of toss that series in the basement with a bunch you know grandpa's other old stuff and magazines and war medals and whatever how do you fight to prevent that man you stay current where you where you really need to where you see trends esports it's east esports it's not a trend it's so well established it's been so well established how do we almost how do we get to the end of this decade and IndyCar is still do 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 nothing nowhere I don't understand we want to be modern and relevant don't tell us we're old okay so what do we do absolutely nothing to be in this space to try and connect with youth I don't get it I continue to not get it. There's been a change in management. Uh, I hope there's something coming, and I'm talking on the marketing and PR side, the, the area where this would happen. I'm confident they're working on something. I'm also confident that, as I've said before, every day that goes by where there's nothing in place here is another day where new fans are not created, where folks who've never heard of IndyCar but love esports, sim, gaming in general, whatever, who take this really seriously to folks who just love to fart around at home and just have fun in the living room, covering all areas. Um, you know, iRacing is pretty amazing. It's also a very niche, very niche thing. Um, something that can reach the masses. You know, it's cool that Project Cars had something that came out however many years ago. Um, I don't know. Uh, can we just agree that if we're talking stage, this has reached the emergency stage. <laughs> this, it just, it either has to get done or we just need to stop talking about it at some point. Say, all right, uh, you've known about it. We've known about it. We've been talking about this for years. Yeah, we're meeting with people. and Yeah, we're going to. Okay. Hope the meetings went well. Hope that they serve good coffee and tea and bagels or donuts or whatever. But I don't see anything else that's come out of this. And it, I haven't done any sim racing for a super long time but I sure loved it when I did. And I know that it just melt, made me feel awesome to know that I was working in the sport, a fan of the sport, just loved racing altogether and could then go home and do something pretty cool. Sim wise. Um, I know that some of you all can and still do small tight knit community type stuff, man. It'd be even better if this is something where ESPN is including this in their coverage of esports championship involved in motor racing. I know that I haven't seen them cover anything racing related with their esports programming, but just the idea that if they were, there's nothing IndyCar would have for them to consider or any other platform that covers this. Um, I don't know. I, I truly don't know why this continues to be a topic. We end up having to discuss B 
because there's complete inaction in terms of having something to show the world. Sure that there's some work going on behind the scenes as I prepare to step off the soapbox here. Brought to you by Miller's Outdated LED Depot. But it's, yeah, at some point in time, there just has to be a byproduct. You know, if we come back to that basement, you can have folks, oh, no, we're down here. We're working away. Oh, boy, we're trying really super hard. Boy, wait until you see what we bring out of the basement. It's going to blow you away. You go, hey, I'm sure there's folks down there working away in the basement, trying to create whatever. Just, man, when that thing never comes into the light, you never get to see it. You just have to wonder. So I don't have an answer. I know it gets brought up. I know that I continue to hope that this gets fixed and that IndyCar uses a fairly common tool to connect with the Utes that they aren't right now. Um, And Nathan, thanks for bringing this up. And also thanks for sending this back in along with your other question. As I ask folks to do, if we don't get to your question, and when I say we, I mean me, and I just did the thing I hate that drivers do when they say we, when they should be saying I, it's 1152. Yeah, this is what you get. It's bad. It's it's really bad. But thanks for listening anyways. Um, Send them back in. If I don't get to it, if we don't get to it, if they, them, if someone doesn't get to it, send it back in. Uh, on my other weekend sports car show, I think three times, four times might be the record. But if you really want it answered, keep sending it in. So I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye here. Going to wake up in a couple hours and go back down to good old Monterrier, Monterey, where I will edit some of the other mistakes here, the ones that I couldn't easily fix, and get this posted hopefully mid to late morning on Friday to compliment. The proper week in IndyCar that went up with Tim Sindrick and Anders Krohn. Please check that out. Tim in particular really enjoyed first week in IndyCar visit for Tim. I thought he brought some great stuff. Anders just, you know, dumpster fire as usual. Um, thanks. Super, super support from you all. And just I don't read a lot of the notes at the end where you all say been praying for you and your wife, hoping the best for you and your wife have had you and my wife. Uh, in thoughts and such just because i don't know uh, i i don't want to keep hitting you over the head with something here uh the same sentence or type of things over and over again but they're at half the half the things that get sent in have something really sweet uh, offered by you all and so thank you um my wife doesn't listen to the podcast but i tell her about these things and so she knows that you all are just, you know, truly uh, like an extended family that we don't know most of you. It's a big old backyard cookout. There are thousands of you, which is crazy for me to contemplate. But there are thousands of you who listen to the show. And I realize that the vast majority of you do not send in questions each week. But regardless, uh, just the amount of really sweet, touching, and heartfelt uh, pieces of encouragement and such that you all send in uh, all driven around my wife and her fight against cancer and also some other things that she's been fighting and winning that war as well. Um, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are certainly days, if not more days than I let on where this stuff is really heavy. <laughs> luckily i'm heavy too so i guess i can bear that weight um i have fairly broad shoulders i can bear this the lord would not give me more than i could bear uh nonetheless i'm also human and this stuff does grind you down and eat away at your confidence at your sanity at your ability to be strong for myself for my wife uh all the things where you go yeah, that, that's kind of part of the deal uh, with something like this. So sending your questions in with just a little item at the end here, like we opened up with Nick Vance, wishing the best for you and Chabrell, my wife. Um, it's really sweet. Thank you so much. And please do not think that because I'm not reading all of those messages that you 
um, often include at the very end of your questions that they are not being received uh, and not actually helping my wife or myself um, just as we try and fight through this to get back to a normal life. Cooper Tires, thank you so much. Thanks for providing the stage this Saturday for our show. Final live podcast of the year. I hope to see you in Monterey in the infield there. Justice Brothers as well. My brothers and sisters there, they have actually been going through some tough family stuff too. And yet just constant encouragement, constant love being sent my way. Uh, Ed Justice Jr. uh, sent me... uh, an email or two this week that just mind blowing, just showing the character of of a person, forget the company, forget the fact that they, the co-sponsor of the, this little thing we do here, just, you know, out of nowhere. Um, but typical of the justice brothers and the justice family, uh, Toronto motorsports. They're, they're my spirit animal. (laughs) Derek Koska. I just love him to death and the fun things that they do and make possible for us with giving stuff away, just great fun stuff. Uh, Roger Warwick, who I love, who does uh, all the all of the art for all my shows and the T-shirts and the stickers and whatever. It's just lots of love there. And then Bell Racing Helmets USA helmets, yes, plural, not singular. Um, another case of brotherhood with them. So yeah, I know I said this probably one or two episodes ago, but. Um, I'm really fortunate to have you all and to have the type of folks that support us on the business side to make this happen because there's nothing cold. There's nothing impersonal about it. Uh, this is just pure encouragement. Go do it, do more, have fun, share, create a community, try and build that community, be active in that community here through the podcast create friends, online friends, some who you might never meet, but um, just go and do fun stuff. We trust you. Uh, They don't really, truly don't ask me to do anything. Uh, There's no, you must say this once a week or you must read it. It's just go, be you, do what you do, create something that folks will enjoy and just get the ride going, keep the ride going and We look forward to being on that ride with you. So I'm a really fortunate person and they're here because of you and I'm here because of you. And so thanks. All right. It's 1158 for my pal, Ryan Terpstra, who keeps excellent time and delights in the fact that I'll tell you, I'm going to go for 17 more minutes and then it's 37. I thought this one just might be fun for you because I know you've been taking notes and uh, keeping track of my discrepancies. All right. Well, I'm Marshall Pruitt. This is a Marshall Pruitt podcast. This is your week in IndyCar Q&A special. I'm going to hit the stop button, go to sleep, and I look forward to talking to you next week at some point, probably late, when we get to discuss a brand new IndyCar champion and Road to Indy Champions, all crowned at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca.